Hello, Norman with iSaveTractors.com here. In this episode, we're going to begin reassembly of our Kohler K301 engine. What you're looking at here is parts from our iSave Tractor Ultimate Engine Restoration and Rebuild Kit. It includes almost everything you need to fully rebuild your engine. Uh, we'll quickly go over everything. We have our two valves, an exhaust valve, intake valve, points condenser, piston, piston rings, wrist pin, retainer clips, uh, ignition coil, connecting rod, gasket set, carburetor, uh, two uh, crank bearings, and there are a few other parts that are included in this kit that we're not going to get to right now. Uh, but essentially this is what we're going to be putting into this engine. Before we get to doing this engine, there are some uh, preparations we need to do. I'm going to recut the valve seats as well as deglaze the cylinder bore. Okay, let's get started with the valve seats. I'm going to be using this new way 46 degree angle uh, seat cutter to recut these seats. Now, if you don't have one of these seat cutters at home, because they're very expensive, uh, you can get by without them. You can first uh, use a brass wire wheel to clean up your valve seats and inspect them. If they're not warped or pitted, uh, you might be able to just uh, use a valve lapping compound to clean up the seats and you're good to go. But if your seats are badly pitted or warped, you want to uh, recut the valve seats. And if you don't have a tool like this, you should take it to a machine shop for them to do it for you. Now here I am preparing to use a valve lapping compound and I'm going to be lapping the valves to the seats. This is not 100% necessary if you use a valve seat cutter and brand new valves. The reason I'm doing this though here is mainly just to test and make sure that my valve seat is making complete and uh, full contact with the valve face of the valve. Here I try to show the camera what this contact area looks like, uh, but the camera doesn't quite focus enough. But this dark line that's left with the valve lapping compound should be in the middle of your valve face. Now it's time to deglaze the cylinder bore. Deglazing is removing the shiny surface off your cylinder bore with a cylinder hone. Uh, here I am using what they call a ball hone, and it, I believe it is a 220 grit ball hone. Uh, and what you're doing is you're going to chuck it to a drill, and you're going to turn the drill on and move in an up and down motion. It doesn't take a lot of motions to get this uh, cross hatch that you're going for. The cross hatch pattern that you're aiming for is about a 30 degree intersecting angle. Uh, and this is how you get it. This is a very important procedure to make sure that your piston rings seat with your cylinder bore. Important note, before you use the cylinder hone, you want to make sure you coat the cylinder walls with a light oil or a honing solution. Uh, if you don't have access to a honing solution, a light motor oil or even uh, like a 10W30 will work fine. Uh, and it's important that after you do the deglazing process, you want to clean out your cylinder bore as much as possible. You want to use a combination of either hot water and soap or solvents, pressure washer. Uh, the point is you want to clean the cylinder wall until white paper towels come out 100% clean. You want to make sure you get all of that grit out of there. When installing the crank bearing onto the PTO side of the engine, you want to make sure you lube up the outer race as well as the bore for where the bearing is going before you install it. Uh, it makes it going in much easier. Here I am just using a bearing installer and a hammer to gently tap it into place. Now next up is the governor. To do the governor, you want to put the engine upside down. You first put in the governor thrust washer right there. And then you just take the governor and slide it onto the governor shaft. I'm sorry, my arm is in the way. And the only thing that holds the governor in place is the governor stop pin, which is this right here. It's a little plastic pin that goes into this uh, threaded hole on the side of the block. Uh, it should have a rubber washer with it. Just screw it in, and now your governor is secure. Next up, we're going to be putting in the governor cross shaft. Uh, the, to put this in, you just reach in from the bottom like I did and just fish it through this hole. Uh, 
and then you back it in and there's a little slot on the other side of the block that it fits into. And then you just thread this uh, governor nut in and that's it. Next up are the tappets for the valves. I marked them when I took it apart with an I and an E for intake and exhaust. After that, you put your camshaft in with your camshaft shim. And then you begin to drive the camshaft pin in. And again, it's a good idea to lube all this up before you put it in. It'll make it much easier going in. And before you fully install the camshaft pin, we want to measure the end play for the camshaft. To measure the end play, uh, there's a, a gap between the end of the camshaft and the engine boss. That's where it is right now. You use a feeler gauge and you measure that and then you compare it to the spec values in the Kohler manual. After you get the end play, you finish uh, pounding that camshaft pin in until it's flush on the PTO side. Now it's time to install the crankshaft into the engine. That little horizontal line to the right of that letter C is your primary timing mark on your crankshaft. That timing mark corresponds with the gear tooth that's directly across from it. We are going to line this gear tooth up with the timing mark on the camshaft. Now that little dot on the camshaft represents the land, which is the space in between the gear teeth. We want to line up the gear tooth from the primary timing mark of the crankshaft to the gear land on the primary timing mark of the camshaft. Before you install the crankshaft, it's important to lube up the surface that's going to be mated against that crank bearing. Uh, not only does it help it go in much easier, but it does give it a little bit of lube uh, when you first start the engine for the first time. It gives it something to ride against. Now to install the crankshaft, uh, sometimes you just have to give it a tap with a plastic hammer. Here I am using a dead blow hammer, and I'm just lightly tapping it in until it just barely makes it to the camshaft. At that point, I'm going to look at the timing marks on the crankshaft and line it up with the timing marks on the camshaft. When I line them up, I'm going to keep tapping it in until the gear teeth start to mesh, and then I can continue uh, tapping it in until it all the way seats against that main bearing. And when you're finished, it's always a good idea to double check your work and make sure that those timing marks are together. Now, before we install the bearing plate to the engine, I want to uh, install that main bearing into the bearing plate side, same way I did the other crank bearing. And now here I am installing uh, a gasket and a couple of shims to go for the bearing plate. Now, notice I lubricate that journal that's going to ride on the bearing. And notice those two studs that are poking out of the engine. Uh, this, you, by using two studs to install this, it makes not only putting the gaskets on easier, it makes this entire process more pleasant. Uh, and all I did was take some 3 8 inch bolts, uh, cut the head off. I cut a little slot in it so I can use a flathead screwdriver to get it out later. And then I used two nuts, and I just tighten them little by little uh, evenly so that bearing plate slides onto the engine over the crank bearing and into place. When I'm finished getting it all the way in, I'm going to remove the studs and I'm going to install uh, proper bolts. Once these bolts are torqued down to spec, I'm going to turn the engine upside down and I'm going to check the crankshaft end play. To check the end play, you stick a feeler gauge into that little tiny gap that you see right before uh, the main bearing there. You check this by using a feeler gauge and you make sure it's within specification that's in the Kohler manual, just like that. If your end play is not to specification, you might need to take the bearing plate off and add or remove shims to get the correct end play. To install the oil seals, you first want to lube up the outer edge of the oil seal as well as the crankshaft. And then you can use a, a small punch and just gently tap the oil seal into place. You want to tap the oil seal all around it to make sure that it's going in even and perpendicular uh, to everything inside. And when you're done uh, punching it in, you can use the depth gauge on a digital caliper or manual caliper to check to make sure that the seal is even on all sides. And doing the PTO side oil seal is the same thing. Loop it up and then put it on and use a punch, go around, and then double check your depth uh, with a depth gauge.
Now we're going to get the piston ready for installation. I lubricate the wrist pin with some motor oil, uh, get it started into the wrist pin hole in the piston, and then I line it up and I just tap it into place. Now it's important to note I had already put the wrist pin retainer clip on the opposite side of the piston, so all I have to do is tap this wrist pin in until it bottoms out on the clip on the other end, and then when that's ready, I put the retainer clip on this side, and it's ready to move over to the engine. Now before we install everything, we want to check the end gap of the piston rings. To do this, you take the top two piston rings, the compression and the scraper ring, uh, you put it in the cylinder bore, you use the piston to push it down into alignment, and then you use a feeler gauge and uh, put it into the gap, and you compare it to what's in the Kohler service manual. Now, these uh, piston rings, the end gap is tight. It is just at the outer limit, so I decided to uh, give it a couple of swipes with a file to bring it uh, a little bit more into a comfortable range. Now, it doesn't take much to take off uh, the end gap of the rings. Just a few swipes of your file and that's what you come out with. When this is all finished, we uh, install everything onto the piston. This is the oil ring uh, expander. This is the bottom rail for the three-piece uh, oil rings. Uh, these ones are thin enough where you can just walk the rings on. You want to be careful if you're wearing rubber gloves like I am that it doesn't catch in there, rip your glove, and then uh, get stuck in the piston. You want to be careful of that. After I put those in, you should use a piston ring expander tool. Next, uh, you install the scraper ring, and then the last ring is the top ring, which is the compression ring. Now, here is an important note on installing this Type A piston. There's no directional mark on the piston itself, but you want to make sure you install the piston so the connecting rod oil hole at the end of the end cap is facing the camshaft, which is under the valves. Now, before you install it, you want to lube the cylinder up with some motor oil. Do the same with the piston. This does a couple things. It primes the, the lubrication for your engine before startup, and it makes installing it much easier. And here I am just using a piston ring uh, compression tool to squish those pistons around, uh, the rings I mean, around the piston so it will go into the cylinder bore. You make sure it's nice and uh, even. You install it again so the oil hole in the rod cap will face the camshaft. To install it, you just give it a few taps with something uh, soft, like this uh, dead blow hammer handle, and it goes in pretty easy. After this, you flip your engine upside down, you add oil to the crankshaft main journal, you push the piston up so the connecting rod uh, fits tightly in there, and then you install the uh, rod end cap uh, properly. Again, you want to make sure that the match marks on the connecting rod line up and that that oil hole is facing the camshaft. It's always good to double check your work like I am here. After you do this, you want to install your uh, bolts to the connecting rod. If you're using cap screws like uh, our particular connecting rod here, uh, you want to make sure you over torque uh, your torque value by a little bit. I believe it's 20% is what Kohler calls for. You over torque it and then you back it off and then you torque it back to the torque spec. So again, here I am. I'm going to torque it uh, a little bit over on both of them. I believe I torque it to 30 pounds and then I back off and then I torque it to 24 pounds, 24 foot pounds that is. And then after you do that, you're all set. And after I install the connecting rod fully, I always like to uh, turn the crankshaft over a couple times and just observe to make sure everything is turning nice and smooth. To install the valves, you first uh, put your valve spring in. You want to make sure that you have that little top cap as well as the little uh, lower cone uh, cap thing uh, on both the top and bottom of the valve spring. After you put the valve spring in, you put the valve in, you use a valve compressor tool to compress that spring so it goes up and out of the way, and then you want to install the two valve keepers. A uh, little trick here to keep the valve keepers on is to just put a little bit of multi-purpose grease on the inside, and then you can stick one valve keeper on, grab the next valve keeper, stick that one on, 
After you install the valves, you want to adjust the valve clearances uh, by using two wrenches to turn in and out that adjustment uh, screw on top of the tappet. Then you use a feeler gauge uh, until it is up to the specification that Kohler uh, specifies. Now there are two numbers when you look at the Kohler manual. There's a larger number and a smaller number. The larger number is for when you use brand new valves and seats. That accounts for a little bit of a break-in as the valves uh, wear into their place. Uh, you want to keep adjusting it until those feeler gauges have a slight drag on it and then you have the correct value. Also, keep in mind, when you make adjustments to the valves, you want to make sure your engine is at top dead center. That is when the, the cam lobes are not putting any pressure on the tappets and the tappets are in their lowest position. Now next up is the valve cover. First you put the stud in and then you're going to put a gasket and then that inner valve cover in. Now note, there is a little tiny oil hole in the bottom of this first valve cover plate. You can see it down there. You want to make sure that's facing down. That gives oil that comes uh, up from your crankcase a place to drain back down in there. Uh, next you put the reed valve in, which is that little metallic spring piece. Then you put the next bracket in and then you put a little rubber bushing, filter, gasket, and then the outer valve cover and you secure with a nut. And when you're finished with that, the rest uh, right here is pretty self-explanatory. This is the camshaft cover. Once again, you always want to make sure you put a gasket in between uh, the cover and uh, the actual uh, engine block. You put in the nuts, you tighten them up. There's really no critical torque specification for these. Just tighten them so they're tight enough. Uh, but you don't want to go too tight where you snap the bolt. Now install the points plunger and the points uh, bracket with the points attached to it. This is also a good time to set the gap setting on the ignition points. Uh, with your engine still at top dead center, use a feeler gauge uh, at 20 thousandths of an inch and then adjust that uh, gap in the points until it is so. Now I'm going to put the points cover over the points. I'm going to do the wiring for the points at a later time in this project when I get this engine uh, on a bench and off of my stand here. But for now I'm going to put that cover on and now I'm going to install uh, our um, this aftermarket fuel pump here, this is made by a company called Stens. It's a fantastic fuel pump. Uh, it is, I believe it is better than the original. It has a polymer housing uh, and it has uh, different end fittings that you can put on there. It's a great product and we are proud to carry it at isavetractors.com. Uh, it's very easy. When you put it in, you just want to make sure that inner arm goes over the camshaft and then you secure it in place with two screws. Uh, now we're moving on to the carburetor. Uh, put the carburetor on with the two nuts. Make sure there's a gasket in between the carburetor and the block. Tighten it up. Uh, again, you want to make it snug, but not too tight. And here I am installing the oil pan. Uh, I'm not going to torque the oil pan down completely because uh, some of the oil pan bolts are covered uh, and inaccessible because this is in the engine stand. But I'm going to snug it up so it's in place, and then when I get this engine off of my stand and onto a bench, I will torque it at that point. Before we install the cylinder head on the engine, we want to make sure it is perfectly flat. I do this by using this granite surface plate and a fine piece of sandpaper. I wet the sandpaper down with water and I stuck it to this uh, surface plate here. That makes it so I can sand this uh, cylinder head back and forth. I go both in a back and forth motion and in a figure eight to make sure that I hit all of the spots. Uh, a surface plate is a perfectly flat surface. Companies make these for machinists, for woodworkers, and for engine uh, builders. And they are extremely affordable. I believe it was only like $30 or $40 on Amazon. And they are tested to be perfectly flat. After you've gone through your cylinder head and you're happy with uh, the surface finish, you remove the sandpaper, you wipe down the surface plate, and you put the cylinder head back on, and then you use a feeler gauge, a 3 thousandths feeler gauge, and you try to slide it underneath the cylinder head in between each of the bolt holes. If the feeler gauge slides through, that means you still have a gap and you should keep sanding. But if the feeler gauge does not slide through any of the areas, then it means you are good to go.
Before I install the cylinder head, I also like to run a tap through all of the threaded holes here just to clean them up. Uh, this helps give me an accurate torque value and it just uh, makes everything much more complete. Uh, that white fluid you see right there is, uh, is a cutting solution that I use on my lathe and it also works great for uh, when you tap holes. Now here I am installing the cylinder head to the engine. First goes the head gasket and then goes the cylinder head and then I like to use uh, brand new grade 8 bolts uh, for the installation of a newly rebuilt engine. Uh, now, in, for this particular engine, I'm not going to torque the bolts down right now because I know there's a bunch of other stuff that goes on top of the head for this particular tractor. So I'm going to uh, put the head on in place and then uh, figure out where all the other stuff goes and then at the end, I will torque it down to spec. And here it is, just this is the, the rope start uh, as well as the starter generator pulley that I'm putting on now. And here comes the rest of the uh, tin for the engine. This is the flywheel housing. And this is where it kind of gets tricky. Uh, you'll see that this little flywheel tin right here, I can't quite get it on. So I actually have to take the cylinder head off, put the tin down, and then put the cylinder head back on. Uh, this is why I waited till after I did all this stuff before I torqued the cylinder head down to its final torque value. And before I put on all the bolts, I always like to give it a little lubrication. Uh, I use WD-40 on a lot of these uh, outer bolts. Uh, it's quick and easy to get. And those WD-40 cans are, are, are great for this sort of thing. Just a little squirt, tighten them down, and then you're good to go. Now here I am torquing uh, the bolts to their torque spec. Uh, Kohler calls for 30 foot-pounds on the head bolts. And what I do is I first torque it to 20, then I torque it to 25, and then I torque it to 30. Uh, you'll notice a little blooper alert here that uh, my head bolts are no longer all brand new grade 8 bolts. Uh, the reason being is some of the grade 8 bolts I bought were too short. So I uh, am temporarily using the original ones for the sake of this video, and then afterwards I'll replace them later. Uh, and here I am. You might see me uh, go through these uh, bolts uh, four or five times, and that's me uh, torquing it up to the torque value and then double checking all the torques when I'm finished. Now comes the air filter elbow, the air filter housing, the air filter itself, and the muffler. All these go in uh, really easily. You just uh, make sure you put a gasket in between this uh, air filter elbow and the carburetor, tighten it with a screw, and then uh, there's also a little bracket that goes on the blower housing. And then everything else uh, is pretty straightforward. That concludes the reassembly of this Kohler K301 12 horsepower engine. Remember, you can buy all of the parts featured in this video at isavetractors.com. We develop complete, full-blown, ultimate engine restoration and rebuild kits, including all iSave Tractor branded parts for your old Kohler K-Series single-cylinder engines. Uh, you can find them all online at isavetractors.com or give us a call. Our phone number is 207-298-9701. My name is Norman. Thanks for watching.